so yeah, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. This is my first time talking to a wider audience, so please be very gentle and kind. Uh, today's topic is talking about alternative ways to secure your Asterisk server. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on cloud-based solutions because I'm assuming if you've got an on-premise system, you already have a very good firewall set up and stuff. So while a lot of what I'm going to talk about is somewhat applicable to on-premise solutions, uh, please take a note that I've pretty much focused this as to you're a small business and you've just spun up an Asterisk system on like a DigitalOcean droplet or an AWS system or something like that. But that being said, can I get like a bit of audience participation? How many people currently have Asterix as an on-premise solution? Wow, OK, more people than I expected. How many people run uh, in an on-cloud solution, like a VPS? How many people are considering moving from on-premise to cloud or vice versa the other way? Like, small handful of you guys. OK. So uh, I just have a small agenda to, to kick up with. I'm going to tell you who I am and what I do. I'm going to talk about IP tables. I'm going to talk about ways you can access your server once you've secured it using IP tables. I'm going to talk about how Twilio can help you secure the trunks that you connect to in into and out of your Asterisk server. I'm going to talk about alerts and triggers that we can set up using Twilio, and then talk a little bit about uh, secure trunking that you can provide, pass all of your trunk information over SRTP. So about me. Uh, I'm a senior technical support engineer at Twilio. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many people have heard of or used Twilio before? Great. So we're definitely here. Um, chances are, if you have any SIP trunking questions, queries, and issues, and you write to Twilio and go, hey, how do I hook this trunk up that I've bought from you guys, or how do I do something with Twilio, you've probably spoken to me in the past, and I'm fairly certain that anybody here that decides to spin up a trunk with us in the next few days, hours, weeks, you will probably send me an e probably send an email in, and it will come to me. Just a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, I'm not a networking engineer. I am completely aware that a lot of what I'm talking about is very bare bones and basic. Uh, it's really just a case of common sense prevails in all modern types of security. You have to think if you give somebody access to your server, somebody else might try and take access from your server. So please always be vigilant. Please always assume the internet is out to get you. Please always assume someone will always try to take advantage of your credit card. But that being said, Asterix in the cloud is great. It's a really quick uh, communications uh, toolkit to have. It's quick to spin up. You can locate it exactly where you need it. I can put a data center. Uh, I can use a data center in London for my London customers. I can use a data center on the East Coast for my East Coast customers. Or I can run something in Asia Pacific, keep the latency down, keep the customers happy. But the possibility of all these virtual boxes of getting hacked is always really high. Bots and scanners. And scammers are always out looking for ways to take advantage of your trunks, your credit cards, and ultimately your processing power to their, at, at your expense. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is IP tables. IP tables are the basis of most Linux firewalls. They allow you to restrict traffic based on your IP addresses. You can whitelist traffic. You can blacklist traffic. You can even do things like allow all traffic, but only to port 80 or port 443, for example. Or you can do combinations of all three of them. You can mix it up as you need to. I've always found when it comes to internet security, it's better to block everything and allow specific subsets of information in as you need it. Here's a really, really crude example of what I'm talking about here. I'm using Twilio as my SIP trunking provider, and I'm using a VPS asterisk box in the cloud. Uh, can I? No, oh, we'll do this then. In this corner here represents your office. So this is a physical place that you have a static IP for. You can. You, you can whitelist this IP address in your cloud box using IP tables, and then send traffic up and down from your office here to your cloud PBX. We can also, with Twilio Trunking, provide you with the IP addresses for the, the trunking will connect into and out of. All the traffic here and here will come over the whitelist, and we'll be able to be easily in co connected into your uh, SIP trunks. Anything else is considered here, hits the blacklist, and just is dropped and rejected straight away. But let me see if I can stop this video at the same time. But there's a problem here. Let's say that you have this really secure, really easy to use PBX in the cloud. You guys go to a Starbucks and someone is trying to act and you need to access your PBX in order to make a phone call. By the, nef by the near definition of locking out all these IP addresses, you're not going to be able to connect to this. No. Uh, OK. 
Okay, there we go. By the mere definition of locking out all these IP addresses, you're not going to be able to connect to your PBX from, from your Starbucks. So you need a way to talk to all of these uh, PBXs that you've got secured with IP tables. I, I found this really cool tool called port knocking. It's like a bit of a speakeasy code for your, port for your server. You can hand it like three or four or five port scans in what appears to be a bit of a random fashion. So you don't have to go sequentially. I could port scan this server at, say, 200, and then 155, and then 192. And that would be the combination for this server. And once the server gets this port scanning information, it will whitelist my IP address for a predetermined time. So you could have 20 minutes worth of whitelist on this IP address, enough time to recall in Starbucks, and enough time to be able to make and receive your calls. And then when you're done, you just stop traffic to it, get up and walk away, and within 20 minutes, the IP that you've just connected from instantly gets blacklisted. You saw, you saw in the video that a, SIP that a SIP client on my iPhone tried to connect to my server. It went up, it tried to connect, it failed. Then I loaded up the port knocking software and I authenticated. Straight away, we went back to the SIP client and it registered immediately. This is really handy. I can take my iPhone, go and sit in a Starbucks, port knock, immediately use their Wi-Fi and their data and their bandwidth to make a phone call using my trunking numbers. This works, I could do this uh, in the UK, I could do this anywhere in the world. I don't have to move my VPS in order to do this, and I don't have to whitelist that IP address using any complex tools. I just loaded an app, I press go, I do the traffic that I need to do, and then I walk away. After 20 minutes, the box shuts down, that specific IP address. So how can Twilio help here? Well, we have a number of things that can sit off-platform that can support the security of your trunks and your asterisk server. We have a thing called geographic permissions and root enablement. This means that, say, I only know that I want calls to the United States. I can turn off calls to all other parts of the world and just simply prevent any call that comes to Twilio, we will just reject on your behalf. We also can provide usage triggers and alerts. So if you know, for example, that you consume 500 or 1,000 minutes on a weekly basis, and you get to Tuesday, and already you've consumed 1,000 minutes or whatever threshold you guys are talking about, you can very quickly and easily fire off an email or a webhook into like a Slack chat room that says, hey, we've already consumed the average number of minutes that we, that we usually use on this trunk very, very quickly and very, very easily. So I already asked this question, but I'm going to go over it just in case. What's a Twilio? Well, Twilio is a voice and SMS messaging provider based in the cloud. We provide you with an elastic. We can provide you with the capability to make and receive phone calls, send and receive text messages, and send and receive media messages all using a web-based API. We can also provide elastic-based SIP trunking. This means that it's not channel dependent. You can scale the number of channels that you need to paste on exactly the call volume. You don't have to buy 50 channels for your peak period knowing that you've only got 20 on a normal basis. Everything is just scales exactly as you need it to. So I'm going to show you now a quick demo of how to use geographic permissions to make and receive a phone call and then block that phone call afterwards. I have my volunteer who already stepped up. So <coughs> this is my client's soft phone, and this is my asterisk connection. We should see now that the 401, which is this client's extension, is connected. And I'm now going to go and grab my telephone number quickly. We can see straight away that the SIP client connected to the Asterisk server, and the Asterisk server is making the call. Hopefully at some point, it should start to ring. OK, can you answer it for me? Aloha. Aloha. Cool, so you can hear me and I can hear you. There we go. You can just hang up now, that's great. Thank you very much. So I haven't done anything new that, asked, that you guys don't already do. You've just made a phone call using Asterix and somebody answered the phone. We've been doing that for like 20 years now using Asterix. But without changing any settings inside Asterix, I can go ahead and disable call into the United Kingdom. I don't have to refresh any dial plans. I don't have to refresh any changes or do anything at all. <coughs> I can make the same call again. The client talks to Asterix, and Asterix talks to the Twilio, the trunk, and says, hey, I need to connect this call. But it fails straight away. Because Twilio rejected the call, it instantly hangs up and says, nope, you're not allowed to call this permissions bit. 
So why is this great? Well, this is really great because if inevitably, or if unfortunately somebody does compromise your box, you can quite quickly and easily disable calling to high cost routes. We happen to know a number of countries and a number of specific routes inside the United States cost more than others. So we can disable them on the fly, or in fact, you can disable them on the fly. This means that even though your box is compromised, hackers can't go anywhere. Nobody can spend your money by changing a dial plan and then reloading it at your expense. Uh, usage triggers. As I briefly mentioned a little while ago, usage triggers allow you to notify, notify you when an application reaches a threshold that you predefine. Like I said, let's say that your call center consumes 5,000 or 6,000 minutes over a roughly weekly period. You can set up a trigger that says when you've reached this period, you can tell somebody. You can send them an email or you can use a webhook to say pop a message into your Slack chat room that says, hey, we've already consumed so many thousand minutes this week. This is really handy if you wanted to keep an eye on administration bits, but it's also really handy if you wanted to say, oh, we already know that we've consumed 10,000 minutes this week and it's Monday. Is there something going on with the server? Are we specifically making more calls or is something stepping out of line that is continuously ringing people on our end? You can manage the expected cost because you know, oh, we've already reached so many thousand minutes for that week or period. More recently, Twilio announced the uh, the launch of secure trunking. We can encrypt the media using SRTP, we can encrypt your signals using TLS, and all of this is configurable both when inside your Twilio account portal, which is found here, but also using our API, which means that you can hook it straight into your existing systems or infrastructure and use this as a white label product behind the scenes. But just to clarify how dangerous it is to keep internet security uh, as a back, just to make sure that people understand how dangerous internet security is, I did the cardinal sin of everything else. I spun up a, digital, a free PBX box, I turned off all the IP table firewalling, and I even did the really, really naughty thing of allowing inbound anonymous calls. I don't know if people can see down here how many calls I had, but this was a four hour period. In four hours, I received over 9,200 requests to international numbers that I had disabled. If I hadn't have turned on geographic permissions, all of this would have cost me money. I worked out that that four hour period would have cost me over $20,000 in numbers, in, in calls to numbers that just didn't come from me. I can't talk to that many people that quickly. So just to give you guys a quick summary here, IP tables are a really quick, easy to use, easy way to lock down your server. Once you have a lockdown server, you can use port knocking to allow you to dynamically whitelist an IP address to call for it, connect to from it, and engage it with your PBX from anywhere you need to. Twilio can help you here by providing uh, geographic permissions. You can tell us what countries you're allowed to call or what routes you're allowed to call in those countries, and we'll allow or disallow the call based on the rules set that you give us. We can set up triggers that say, hey, you've already spent so many minutes this day, week, month, period, is there something going on with your server? We can also provide you with secure trunking connections to our carrier teams. Does anybody have any questions? I appreciate that was a bit fast. We've got to now quite a run to the dangerous demos bit because I've been looped into that at the same time. All right, if nobody does have any questions, and yes, I okay, would agree, everybody needs to go straight to dangerous demos. That's right over there, it's in Java C one and two. All right, thank you very much, Matthew.